every rock station tries to be irreverent, you know, that's the thing. We're reverent, we, we don't care what other people think. But as you listen to this KRZ, you realize they don't. That was the radio station for the Fresno Rocker. KRZR was the go-to radio station whenever we booked shows. It was its own beast. I remember listening, I remember the first time I listened to Jen do Freak News, I was like 12 or 13, driving down 99 and hearing the morning show and it was just chaos. And then over the years, I was like, I have to be a part of that. And I walked in and it was like, oh crap. And KRZR was the one station that was in your face and actually bragged about it. You name it, it was something it was just ridiculous. What could we not do? I mean, and a lot of it would involve lawsuits and stuff, and we'd still do it. So it was just, you know, it was radio on crack. They were fever. I mean, you had to be careful. Since I worked on that station, I can tell you, you didn't just go in the air and say, man, I wish somebody put a bullet in that guy. Because somebody might do it that day. Living on the East Coast, I knew people who worked in radio on the East Coast that wanted to work at KRZR. Rick's coming through, he's like, no, 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 you're gonna have to stick your tongue. Stick your tongue in. So okay, I go in, and I actually go in for the kids. The donkey almost bites my tongue off. KRZR was all about imagination. It was all about finding something that was amusing and blowing it out to this insane proportion. They were the kings of making mountains out of gold. <laughs> KRZ was a kick-ass rock station. I mean, like, kick-ass rock station. Like, no other station I'd ever saw, saw before. It was, uh, it was not just music. And I know that sounds really cliche, but it was a lifestyle. More like the heavy, you know, death metal, black t-shirt, Keystone, but, you know, just what they are, dude. Yeah. And I always thought they were just like this big throbbing gristle of like, Brr. So we came, we saw, and we rocked, you know, and that's, that's the best thing you can say about any rock station. If, you know, if it wasn't for the callers at KRZR, you wouldn't be doing this film. KRZR is just crazy, wacky stuff, you know? I, you know, along with them, it's the crazy, wacky DJs, crazy, wacky bits, and everything that goes with it, along with music. It was, it was always going to be a wild hair. Uh, good or bad, uh, it was my idea. Um, it was going to be the wild hair because it's the only radio moniker that made sense. If you grew up loving hard rock and heavy metal music, Chances are there was a kick-ass radio station in your hometown that turned you on to all your favorite bands. And if that radio station is still around, it's probably not as good now as it was back in the day. This is the story of KRZR in Fresno, California. Best station I ever worked for and probably one of the best rock stations I've ever heard. It's also a time capsule, a throwback to a bygone era when rock radio really mattered. Ask any kid these days and they'll tell you, radio's not cool anymore. But you ask any headbanger who grew up in Fresno and they'll all tell you, it used to be. Typical KRZ our listener? Yeah. He's He's letting out his rocker just enough to keep his job. <laughs> uh, so his hair may not be all the way down, but it's it's you know it's not super short either. Although there was a lot of guys like that, you know. As soon as it got okay to grow facial hair again, here it comes. Here comes the goatee. Everybody got one. Um, he may not wear a black concert T-shirt every day, but he either has twenty of them, or God help him, one that he wears all the time. And so you know what you know what a concert a black concert shirt. Starts getting brown and there's no reason for it. <laughs> that guy. Uh, he wears jeans. Um, God help me, he probably wishes he had an El Camino. I'm always blown away by how genuinely cool rock fans are and, and KRZR fans were. You know, like, be a little scary sometimes you know I might not <laughs> I might ask for like a, someone to walk me to my car some nights when we were out at an event but. the Fresno rock audience is someone that was knowledgeable um, and they knew their stuff for me it was a little bit scary actually a little bit because I realized some of them would do anything for you if you ask them to. Right. And, and that's nice it's flattering but it's also scary because if you told them I want you to skin a goat and wear it all day they would and that is a fright
right thing to do. And, and they're, not, they're, they're genuinely giving from the heart. They're, they're scary, too. They're, 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 they're scary. They are scary. But uh, but most of them are really good from the heart. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not pretentious. They don't show up and act in any way other than that they are. And I really dug that, man. It's like, what you see is what you get. And I and they were the happiest people I've ever met. I love I love the Rock Kids in Fresno, man. They're they're like some of the most supportive, fun people I've ever been around in my life. And it's it seems almost unique to Fresno. Demographics and analysis aside, Fresno is a market that responds to authenticity. That responds to uh, people coming from a place of sincerity. Uh, Fresno. Fresno loves somebody who is being who and what they really are. And KRZR was being exactly what the personalities who worked there wanted it to be. When you go to a KRZR event, it was the entire spectrum. I mean, there was li literally a little bit of everything. And, and that was what was cool too. It was a slice of Fresno because go through Fresno. You have everything from the farmers to, you know, corporate guy to whatever, and they were all listening. So it really was a nice cross section. The women sometimes rock harder than the men because True. like when, if Kiss came to town, they're the, all, do the, the women would show up <laughs> like, like, like if we were giving away Rob Zombie tickets, like we could get a kid to eat, you know, dog food and corn off of RJ's feet. No problem. It happened. But if Kiss was coming to town and we would have had front row seats to like Kiss, Every woman in her early 40s or whatever age they were would have showed up and said, I don't care what I gotta do. I'm getting those tickets. It takes a certain amount of grit to live in this town and to claim it as your own. Now you can bag on President as much as you want if you live here, um, but don't come in from the outside, you know? Like you can call your own sister ugly, but you can't let anybody else. Um, I don't know, it's just, they're just real, you know? I don't, I don't fit well, it's a bunch of misfits and I fit in perfect with the Misfits. If you didn't cruise Blackstone with KRZR, you totally missed out on what cruising Blackstone was all about. Uh, <laughs> amateur tattoo artist on his second marriage, three kids from four different moms. <laughs> Actually, that's just the staff, but um, I, would, I, I would say that the, a Fresno rocker is just like a KRZR DJ, except they bathe more. This is where I differ with a lot of people. I'm, I'm not convinced that there is a typical Fresno rocker. That was one of the things about KRZR. I mean, sure, you had the guys in their Slayer shirts. Um, you, you, you know, you, you had the real extreme, but I mean, there were just regular, everyday, ordinary people who just enjoyed rock music and enjoyed a little craziness. Who, you know, who actually had jobs. Um, you know, I mean, that was really the 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 bulk of KRZR's audience. For example, at one point, 66% of KRZR's audience owned a home. So it, it, it wasn't just crazy rock in the meth lab people that listened to KRZR. That always chapped my hide. Um, that was a reputation about KRZR's audience that wasn't completely deserved. Sure, the meth lab guys, they listen to us too. And yeah, we, we bear the shame of being on Cops twice uh, <laughs> that showed our sticker, two different arrestees. Yes, my own father-in-law, uh, you know, his car was stolen. They found it in, a, in an abandoned field. And when he finally got the car started, it was blasting KRZR. Yeah, okay, all of those things are true. Um, but that's not all of KRZR's audience. When they came to Fresno, it was literally a breath of fresh air. There was this whole moment, people mentioned KKDJ. There was this whole moment where, you know, KKDJ was it as far as rock and Dean and Don and the Breakfast Club and all those guys. And then there was this lull. There was this magic, 1027. And there was this crap that just came here that was, it was like it was okay to do. And it really wasn't. So. They started this new rock station, and there was this point in time where my friends and I would sit outside of a guy's garage out in the middle of nowhere where it's all houses now, but would be a point to be like put on ZR and drink beer at underage and rock out to whatever they were playing at night. And they weren't playing crap again, dude. They were playing, they were playing good stuff. I mean, it was rock. It was rocking Fresno. The station started out as part of the the rock 40 format. We were we were almost more top 40 than we were rock, uh, but I changed that very quickly. 
and I, I bucked the tide and I bucked the company who owned us at the time and I made it more rock. I got rid of the pop elements as fast as I could. Uh, I shot straight for the heart of 18 to 34 year old guys. My father had a 1986 Suburban that he modified the sound system on and no quarter from Led Zeppelin came on. And my dad showed me that that was the song why he set up his system with it and he had the speakers zooming around and round. And I mean, back, I just, I just have these memories of my father sitting there drinking a Coors Light Tallboy uh, driving down the 99 with me listening to Led Zeppelin on the Psychedelic Supper with KKDJ and I think that was it. And uh, it was when KRZR came on the air, I mean, you had... I mean, come on, people, Guns N' Roses was hit, and, you know, Tool was like an underground background thing. I mean, you know, a few years after Karazir came on the air, but it was like nobody was playing what Karazir was playing. It was the music that pissed off your parents. KRZR was still real new at that time. I'd kind of heard of them, didn't really know what it was, um, but we went to a preview, a midnight showing of Batman with Michael Keaton and... Jack Nichols. Jack Nichols. And I remember waiting in line out front and KKDJ was giving away bat crap. That was their that was their, their sling, you know, their their thing. And we were all standing out front of the theater, and it's the old theater off of Barstow and Shaw, where it's a used car lot now or whatever it is, yeah. but we were in front of the theater waiting for the show and this Mercedes pulls up and I couldn't even tell you who did it. Somebody jumped out of the car, there was about four guys. They jump out and they scream, KKDJ gives you bat crap. KRZR gives you munchies. And they flung corn nuts all into the crowd. <laughs> T-shirts, corn nuts, all kinds of hats. <laughs> they made the fatal mistake of asking people in the audience when we were in the theater to, if you give them something that KRZR had their name on a shirt or whatever, they would give you something in return that has their name on it. Well, when they asked for something from them, corn nuts just flew clear up. I mean, and not in the bag either. It was just handfuls of corn nuts raining up on the stage. There's a lot that's said about Fresno and the dynamic musically of it's a hard rock in town. Has that always been true? Boy, it was when I got here. Uh, and, and quite frankly, that made it easy. Because, uh, you know, really hard sounds that wouldn't have worked elsewhere uh, worked in a you know a white blue collar town like Fresno. Wow. I do not remember ever dressing up as Guido Sarducci. <laughs> Look at that mullet. Look at that mullet, dude. Chris Daniel was actually my first hire, um, although Chris Daniel almost never got the job because I had a resume for him, but the phone number was bad on it. I lose my job in Tucson working for some bebop station. I don't remember why. I'm sure it has something to do with me. Um, and I, I get so broke that I, I just hit the road. So I, I tried calling him at KRQ in Tucson. Uh, he worked the all night shift. And for three nights in a row, I woke up in the middle of the night in Salt Lake City to call him. And you know, I'm trolling the request line, and it would ring, and it would ring, and it would ring. Typical disc jockey never answering the line. When it finally did ring the third day into it, um, you know, I told him who I was, and I really needed to leave a message for Chris Daniel. And the response was, oh man, they fired him yesterday. And I, I begged him, I begged him to pass a message on saying I was trying to offer him a job. I go to Palm Springs, it's 118 and I'm in a jacket and tie. I don't get that job. Um, and I headed up to Bakersfield where this, this dude who ran, ran the Bakersfield station knew my dad, so I'm trying to make a hook up. And, um, and I'm sitting in his office and this call comes in and the guy takes it. I thought, oh, that's kind of rude, you know, having an interview here. And see Curtis Johnson going to this guy, Rick, do you have any idea if Chris Daniel is alive or dead and where I can find him? Because I'd sent him a bunch of tapes. And uh, he said, he's sitting in my office right now, which apparently caused E. Curtis to make a little bit of, little bit of cheese in his pants because it was too weird. And I, did it, I did the KRZR deal from room 206 at the Motel 6 on California Avenue in Bakersfield. Uh, if it wouldn't have been for that, Chris would have never come to Fresno. Um, it's it, what 
it's what told me that this was supposed to happen. And in those days, I didn't listen to those inner voices. I just kind of went on impulse. But this one said loud enough, you better go. I realized we were special when we were successful without any money. I mean, we didn't even have, I mean, we didn't even have leadership other than, okay, the PD and the disc jockeys. But there was no corporate management. There, there was no direction from above. I mean, it was, it was literally the inmates leading the asylum. We, we got to do radio. We, we got to do what was in our black hearts uh, and have fun with it, and the audience responded. The golden age of any radio, and especially rock radio where there were a lot less rules, which means more imagination can spring up and play, is just that. It's the theater of the mind. It, whether you're, you know, doing adventures in Cleavage Canyon, which is all scripted and acted out, and I'm all nervous like a little n mother hand on my bit, you know, full-blown radio theater, or just, nobody did it better than you, just that one little break where you, where you present a situation that's going on in the studio that ain't going on in the studio. It's all going on up in your head. And a year later, somebody comes and tells you about that bit you did. You know, they were that they were willing to believe. They wanted to believe. It was a better world than what they were living. It was a better world than what we were living. When I first put Chris Daniel on in mornings, um, we had just got a consultant. The, uh, the general manager who left shortly after that had forced a consultant on us. And the consultant uh, was trying to force us to be a more music morning show. Uh, no, thank you. The final word on that consultant uh, for me was uh, I got his, his approved music list every week. And he had the approved list and it was the turkey list. And on the turkey list at the top was Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. Now, I didn't know that Nirvana was going to be as big as they are, but I knew that song was a hit. I knew that song was going to be a hit. And that was the final straw for me. Uh, and I fired the consultant. In fact, we, we got into an argument over on the phone about it, uh, and we literally rushed to our fax machines. Hey, remember those? Uh, we really rushed to our fax machines to both fire each other. But since I was literally signing the checks at the time, uh, he wasn't signing my checks, I, I was signing his. I got to fire him. Goodbye, consultant. When, when that problem went away, um, we, we finally got a, we finally were able to uh, unleash Chris on the morning show. I'm second generation radio. My dad did 51 years, uh, 45 of them in New York. I'm really proud of them. It's a reason why, you know, I use my last name. It would have been a lot easier just to use a fake name. Um, and he is as different from me on the radio as you could possibly be, but there's a conversational tone. Uh, I, made, I guess I got it from my dad, and I didn't know I got it from my dad. Again, he was able to uh, to draw people in every morning, and, and they became so passionate about him and about the station, and they, they followed him. They became followers of, of Chris in the front row. Like, he had people like Rush Limbaugh has people, you know? I mean, and they were like, oh, well, that's not what Chris says. It's almost like it was they had a little book the book of Chris, you know, and they would go and, and check it out from time to time. I was class clown uh, from second grade on. Anytime I got in trouble, it was me trying to get noticed, me trying to... But I don't remember staying an attention whore. I just remember being a fan of humor, and I really wanted to be the guy that had the line. Or I wanted to be the guy in the room that was in the room when the line was delivered. When I first started at Cares Ear, when I first started in the front row, we had um, Tweaker Russ, this this guy that we called Tweaker Russ, who wanted so badly to be a part of it. And, and he was a fun guy, but he was insane. And he we sent him out, and this was in the days, and again, how things change, you could have people come in and, and work for free without being an intern or without, just some guy. And, Tweaker Russ, we sent him out, he did listener lawn wrestling. He, we would send him to people's houses and they would come out in the front lawn and he would wrestle them to the ground. And it was a matter of, you know, who's gonna win, Tweaker Russ or the listener? We would place bets. No way in hell you can do that now. Yeah, there's, there's Chris and Jen 
and Aaron Giant in the lead. Excuse me. There's two front rows. There's Chris and Jen and Aaron the Giant Lee. And there's Chris and Jen and Daniel. And Brad coming later. And then, you know what? Yeah, there's she. This is the problem of naming people. No, there's three front rows. Then there's Chris and Jan and Brad. And then there's Jen and Brad. And then Chris comes back. And then Chris goes. And it's uh, and Jen and Brad. And you know what? There's a whole lot of front rows, isn't there? You know, this, this will surprise a lot of people, and it won't surprise some people. Every day we walked in there, we had little if no clue what we were going to do that day. I swear to God. All we knew was we're going to throw the phones open, we're going to start talking, something's going to happen, and we had the freedom, it was very important, we had the freedom to do what we wanted. E. Curtis gave us enough rope to hang ourselves, but he let us dance with it. And, and that was the, the freedom of the front row was something I'll never forget, and I haven't seen anything since then. It's hard to express how lucky I was to find Jennifer and Brad, and also Dano, who also had it, um, and, a, and, a, and one of the greatest dry humors in the world, Aaron the Giant Lee. Uh, but Jen and Brad with Jen and Brad. And there were markers, we knew certain things, but mostly I just got really lucky to find two unbelievably naturally funny people who got it, you know, who understood. When it was time for them to shine on their own, they shone on their own. When it's time to work as a team, they worked as a team. It, you know, it, when one of us was trailing, somebody would come in with something. That's something Chris did. Chris is good at, at spotting what people can do and at bringing the best out. That's another, as far as Chris's abilities, he, he really knows how to, to highlight other people's skills. And there, was, there was chemistry in there. Without that, it would have been just three people. Without that, that's another thing about radio is that if you don't have chemistry, you can't teach it, you can't learn it, you can't buy it. But when you have it, your show's transformed. It's something different after that. I just appreciate quick, good humor. I don't particularly have quick, good humor. Brad has it, Jen has it, Rick has it, uh, a couple others has ever had it. I, I have to go off on a story, or it takes me a long time to get where I want to go. Well, what were your thoughts when you heard the front row? Well, they had their thing, and we weren't even going to go against them because they were number one, and uh, we were told, you come into town, don't even worry about those guys. They've got that market right there. If you can be number two or number three, which we ended up, everybody was happy. They really kind of led the, led the station forward. They were always pushing the envelope, always uh, trying to you know dip their toe over the line, and and yeah, to have the longevity that they had. Was there a point when you guys were banned on school buses? <laughs> I've heard that rumor. I can't say that it's completely true. I don't know. No, I actually I know that in Clovis school buses we were banned for a while. Uh, the front row specifically was banned. And I don't think it was for any one reason. I think it was just, you know, the, a perception of, oh, these wild ass rockers and they're, it's too much. It's too much for the kids to be hearing. Uh, outside of Dingo Boy, <laughs> which I'm sure everybody said, it, it almost after getting into radio when I found out that Dingo Boy wasn't a physical person that lived in the KRCR studios. Um, oh God, um, lawn sausage freaks. Like, I remember uh, going into finals one day. Uh, and I made my mom put the phone next to the radio so I could hear Jen's top 100 freaks, but it was like the top 10. So I put it next to the Phone, the her phone next to the radio, and I went in and I was listening on my cell phone before class started, so I could hear a story about the lobster. I started taking these stories and I started looking for the ones that were like that, and um, and I titled them Freak News. Okay, we're gonna do Freak News, and it caught on, and it caught on like wildfire. The reason it's kind of an albatross sometimes though still is trying to constantly one up that now there's a standard that's been set it was one thing when it was lucky the guide dog who's killed his last f five blind owners you know which is an awesome story this blind dog this guide dog had to be retired because he literally killed five of his owners he walked one into traffic he walked one off a pier i mean that's an amazing story but you can't you can't have stories like that every day unfortunately so yeah i mean trying to search the underbelly of the web to find the next person that stapled the wound shut and resumed work. That's hard. <laughs> I know one of the programs I used to like, uh, the, the morning uh, team there, they had uh, 
had burn a bud Thursdays that uh, they used to do. That was one of my favorite. In fact, I used to listen to it. Uh, if I were in my car, I would tune to KRZR just to hear burn a bud Thursdays every Thursday morning. Burn a bud, which anybody who's not familiar with, burn a bud Thursdays were um, you'd set up a friend of yours, send us a letter, and tell us why your buddy should be burned. You know, and uh, and we create this elaborate story. Um, oh, you accidentally returned a, a homemade porno tape instead of the movie that you rented. Um, that sort of thing. He was charged with taking his nephew, who was 14 or 15 years old, on a date, chaperoning the nephew and his girlfriend to a movie and dinner. And the entire time, this dickweed is bagging on his nephew, telling his date that he's only got one testicle. Well, the nephew's mother, so brother of writes into the front row when Berna Buds comes into existence and says, here's the deal. There's nothing wrong with my kid, but my brother, the uncle, he's only got one nut. They get this guy on the phone. Chris and Jen double team him, going back and forth, pretending to be a doctor's office, alleging that his nephew has been in a bicycle accident, he had crushed his testicles, and he needed a transplant. And they're just after this guy. Sir, you're the, you're the closest biological match. We need you to donate. And finally, the guy says on the air, look, doc, I've only got one nut. I hear, hold please, and you hear whole music playing and ha 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 off mic. And then he comes back, and Chris asks the guy, I'm sorry, sir, we're trying to get help for uh, you know, your nephew so-and-so. You know, we, we, need, we need to get a testicle, blah, blah, blah. And the guy says, look, doc, my name is and I only have one nut. They, put, they, they string them along just a little bit longer, and then Chris starts laughing. He goes, I'm not a doctor. I'm a morning show host, and you're a prick. And this man lost his mind. We, we told somebody they brought the wrong baby home from the hospital. <laughs> But what was best was the picture that we painted of the baby that, that was going to be traded for them. Oh, it's beautiful. Kind of like a jack-o'-lantern baby. One molar, one tooth, right in the front. <laughs> the first thing you said to me was, you're not going to impress me by, you know, saying dick. I've heard every word for dick there is. Really? And I said, you know, have you ever sucked the, the cheese flag at the beef pit? And then he, what? So I was at the Save Mart, and we were discussing whether the eating produce was stealing, or if it was just sampling. Yeah. And I, and I was standing there, I was looking at the potato aisle, and there was a potato that looked much like a dick. And I said, hey, I go, I haven't done my piano. He said, oh yeah, so he plays the music, and I said, you know. And now from the, the produce aisle, the word today is dictator. Nobody can say more in less words with maximum creativity to get his message across at Brackies. I've never seen anything like it. He did it the first day he was there. He did a penal euphemism on his tryout. I don't think we had done two breaks. And he's talking about, how did it go? Sinking the beef pole into the cheese pot. Like, uh, how, how many penal euphemisms do you think, would you ask, uh, thousands? I have a list of them at home. I, I'd say they probably verge on uh, a thousand. Shoot me off some of your favorites, if you, if you remember any. The telescopic spelunker. Uh, the master cylinder with Philip Oliver Canyon. One old baloney phone. Pajama! March 14th, 1997. Okay, I remember smelling smoke. That wasn't always a good thing. <laughs> the on-air vasectomy um, is what keeps in my mind, I, I can't decide, thought Brad Giesa might be the most homophobic person in the world, but it might be Dano. <laughs> I could, he was the producer of the show at the time and uh, also on air with us and he wanted to he was there in the doctor's office and he thought that he was actually going to pull off covering this putting a mic in my face getting all the shots getting the other reactions and not seeing my balls <laughs> uh, so somebody's what, what we're going to do who's going to hold the mic you know I'm, like, well, I'm not staying in here for this thing so I ended up, uh, I handed the mic, I was just outside the door of where the procedure was taking place on Mr. Chris Daniels and stuff. So I go in to see Dr. Dale, I remember his name, and Roxanne was with me. Yeah, yeah. I go in, and they gave me a little local, and then they gave me a shot of Versed. 
Uh, it's kind of like a suitcase in a syringe. You know, it, <laughs> you, you're not unconscious, but you don't really remember anything. So it could get you in trouble pretty fast. So, okay, real fast. Dan Oak covering his eyes like this. Um, but he's done something devious, and I've never known to this day if he accomplished it. Prior to doing it, I said that they were going to give me this drug called Versed. Well, we all know what Versed is now, but it was kind of new then. And I was afraid that I was going to get so honest that I was going to start forgetting where I was and talking about things in my private life that you know I just never would want to talk about. So I said to the doctor, look, I can take a lot of pain. Give me half of what you would normally give. What I don't know is, Dano's on the side dealing to make a better show. He's saying give him twice what you would normally give. And I, to this day, don't know which it was because as soon as the Versed went into my veins, I completely understood heroin, <laughs> which I've never done, but I really got it because I felt fantastic. So I'm chatty and I'm talking, and I'm trying to do the show. And I, I remember that I thought we were going off the air because when they zapped him with the laser, it cut short and cut out the mic. I saw the sparks flying out from under the door when they zapped his thing. It was, uh, <laughs> it was interesting. <Yeah. laughs> when it came time to cut me and then cauterize my man's spaghetti, every time that doctor hit, hit it, God damn it, he hit it a lot. <laughs> Apparently, it sh our little portable thing, it would shoot it out, but it, what, what listeners apparently were hearing was, okay, he's going down there, and he's about to make a... And we had a choice between the wild hair and the power pig. And when you consider how dirty we were, the things we said on the air, the blue jokes, the boob jokes, the dick jokes, that I mean, it just never stopped. The music was as dirty as we were. People were loving it. And here we come with a bunny when we could have been a pig, we were a pig. You know, I really give all the credit to the Wild Hair to E. Curtis, the program director of the station. Um, that was really E's vision to have a, have a character or have a mascot for the station. I needed to reinvent KRZR. Um, I needed to get it away from um, what, what the old Z-Rock listeners thought it should be and what the old KKDJ listeners thought it should be. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to give it a visual marking, marketing presence. Um, and so I came up with the wild hair. You know, it's just a play on words as in, you know, having a wild hair up your butt. And I roll up to KRZR and it was cool because I got here right before the unveiling of the wild hair. I, I was, I literally, my first day on the air was January 17th, 1994. And that Friday, we had the bit, at, when I came out here, it was just 1037 KRZR. We invented a fictitious character named Sharon Bellows, and we promoted her as being a thrill seeker. You know, we, we said that she had, um, you know, skydived off the St. Louis Arch. Uh, we said that she had, you know, skateboarded the face of Grand Coulee Dam. I mean, you, you can't do any of those things. <laughs> Uh, but we just we just painted this this woman as being this thrill seeker, and her next big stunt was that she wanted to give birth live on the radio. Sure enough, Friday morning we we did a remote broadcast, and and we had uh, one of our part timers was out there on a table with a silhouetted thing for anybody who wanted to come out and see it. That was there was the visual as much as there was the audio, which is important, you know, dinner and a show. There. I get a call from a woman in the Attorney General's office. She's a Deputy Attorney General. And she is just indignant that a woman 
is going to give birth in a parking lot without medical attention. And I, I don't remember what I said to her. It wasn't very polite. Um, and I let her know that she had been suckered and that possibly with all the other things going on in California that maybe she should spend the taxpayers' money in another way. Like a wild hair. I don't even get that, man. Dude, it's so work. It just so worked. Wild hair was an odd mascot, I thought. I mean, I, I get it. Wild hair, you got a wild hair up your ass. Um, but it was it was easy for the competition to go, hey, nice bunny, you know, and that, ah, ah. There's nothing worse than hearing, hey, I saw your bunny up the other day. Ah, yeah, mm, don't call it a bunny. And that, there, if there was anything you could do that would piss off E. Curtis when he was program director, just call it a bunny. I don't understand where it came from, um, but it fit. I hated that big inflatable. I fucking hated setting that thing up when it was 100 degrees outside and hot and it was gross and you'd get this black grime on you and we tried washing it and you couldn't get it off. We must have had, I think we ended up, uh, in the, we went through three different wild hair inflatables and uh, you know we would take that thing out to just about anywhere we could think of. It, it made a statement when that thing was up and you saw it on the street corner, you know, it, it, it meant something to see that, that big wild hair. Now Dale Berry um, was the guy that I hired to draw the wild hair. Okay, Dale's day job was drawing comic books. On the weekends, he, he works at a rock station. I mean, it's hell like the dream job or what? It's funny, if you, if you ever meet Dale Barry and take a look at him, and take a look at the wild hair, you're gonna notice more than a few physical similarities that no one will ever, ever, ever actually admit. <laughs> I mean, did you give him guidance, or did he start with something, and then you kind of critiqued it? What was the evolution of that? Yeah, I had a vision for what I wanted it to look like. Um, Dale and I would argue about that sometimes, because, you know, I was, I looked at it as, you know, I'm the architect and you're the builder. And sometimes he would say, oh, no, 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 you're the builder, I'm the architect. There, you know, there was this struggle sometimes of what the thing should look like. One time, one time I told Dale, I says, look, Dale, I'm the art director here. And he looked me square in the eye and he goes, well, you may be the art director, but you are not a art director. <laughs> And, but he was right. But he was right. He was right. He was the professional artist. I was just a disc jockey with a dream in my head. It took off like wildfire. Uh, once again, uh, E really knew the market. He knew what the people would respond to. And, uh, and rarely in my entire career have I ever seen a audience bond with uh, a, a, a station mascot before. Certainly I've never seen them respond the way they did to the wild hair. Uh, we ended up doing 40 plus t-shirt designs, uh, uh, um, multiple uh, 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 product designs, uh, uh, inflatables, uh, billboards, uh, etched beer mugs, uh, the paintings on the sides of buses, uh, just tons of advertising. Uh, um, I heard once that uh, some numbers had been crunched somewhere and that the wild hair was in fact, nationally speaking, the second most recognizable iconic mascot for a radio station in its market in the US. When we started doing the the, the wild hair series of, you know, uh, Hercules and Metalla hair or whatever it was, some of those were great. I still have all those t-shirts. Basically, we kind of covered our cost. Um, you know, we made a little bit of money, but only so we could buy more t-shirts. And, and we gave away a lot of them. I mean, I have some favorites, um, and they're all bad puns, every single one of them. Um, Jägermeister, that's a good one. The, the Jägermeister, the favorite part about the Jägermeister is if you look at a bottle of Jäger, it has old German written around it. I actually found a woman who spoke German to translate that for me so that we could do a spoof on the writing around it. I mean, Dale went to meticulous detail, you know, to, to make the, you know, the head of the hair look like the stag on the bottle of Jaeger. I mean, it's just parody, parody, parody. Show Us Your Wild Hair was, was a great idea. Show Us Your Wild Hair, the intent was, okay, we've got $10,000. 
do the craziest thing. Show us your wild hair, Fresno. We introduced the campaign with show us your wild hair for $10,000. And people did all kinds of crazy things. There was a woman uh, who you know, dressed as Lady Godiva. She, she wore four things, a horse and three stickers. And she, uh, she, she rode this big white horse on the northwest corner of Sean Blackstone. Uh, me and the general manager, Chris Pacheco, almost got arrested that night. We, we made it as far as the back seat of the cop car. And there was, there was this little short five foot three uh, duty sergeant. You know, I mean, he had this terrible Napoleon complex. Boy, he was reading us the riot act. And we're sitting in the back of this cop car just kind of going, yes, sir, yes, sir, okay, we won't do this again. Uh, you know, we just didn't want to go to jail. The show us your wild hair contest, especially the first one. I never saw a guy dive face first into pure animal feces before. Face first in, in a, what were we in a big lots to parking lot or something, and he just ate it, and he came up out of that with a smile, a big smile, thinking for sure I've got the ten thousand dollars. I just dove face first into into pig shit. He had pig shit on his teeth, and he came in fourth. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Higginbotham and Eric Meacham um, were two guys, they were kind of young, um, you know, kind of starving college students. They, they had two crap cars. And they, what they did was they took these two cars, they took these two old cars, and they did the top half of a KRZ or a bumper sticker on one car, and the bottom half of a KRZ or a bumper sticker on the other car, and they hired a crane to come out and drop the one car on top of the other and make this huge bumper sticker out of two old cars. They filmed the whole thing and bought a commercial on, I think it was KC24 at the time, I'm not sure, but they aired the commercial of the creation of a KRZ or a bumper sticker. It was phenomenal. That was the winner. $10,000. Show us your wild hair too. I literally thought I was wa gonna watch a man die in front of me. That was Show us your wild hair too for $20,000 actually killed that campaign because the the winner was a guy, I don't remember his name, um, but it was three paintball fanatics and um, they came up with this bright idea, hey let's take a hundred paintball shots to a bare chest in a minute. Uh, but he came out and he was he was just in his underwear and he, he came out. <laughs> he has he had two paintball buddies and this guy was kinda this is as close as they'll let me get to the army, you know, kind of guy. And so when the paint when he was getting ready to whatever he was shooting, he was really serious and he hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him in the chest with these paintballs from I, I want to say 30 feet was really close, and he hits him. Of course, so you see the paint, but it's not 30 seconds after he's finished firing that these like moon craters start erupting like this on his chest. I mean, all over the place and his legs and stuff. But mostly, this guy was pretty good at hitting a guy in the center point. And they're getting big, and they're getting red and they're bleeding. And, and then he did something that was, he didn't tell us he was gonna do in the rules. When he took the shots, he took two bottles of rubbing alcohol and poured it on himself. I, I, I've never been more scared in my life. And then he went into shock. <laughs> never saw anything quite like that before. So there was a moment of, there are a lot of people here and this guy could die. <laughs> I thought, we've gone too far, something bad is going to happen to this guy. Fortunately, it didn't. The mind blower was, the guy wins $20,000 and split it evenly with the two guys that shot him. But the next year, when we tried to do Show Us Your Wild Hair for $30,000, and our first entry was a guy who said that he would nail his scrotum to a stump, we realized it's over. It's over. People thought it was a self-mutilation contest, which it wasn't. That was that was never what Show Us Your Wild Air was. It had nothing to do with self-mutilation. Okay, it's running of the sheep. It's about to happen. It's got to take you to the court and show you what's up here. So you can see as you walk through here, this is going to be the holding camp. I got the, the really great privilege of having a stupid idea, bringing it to the show before I even thought about it, got it on the air, 
we started this you know campaign we, we made the city a bad guy before the city was a bad guy the incarnation of running of the sheep started before i even got here chris daniel had been saying for a while there was some story about the running of the bulls and he said if we can have running the bulls why can't we have running of the sheep let them run <laughs> and and there was a listener at one point who paid out of pocket to have a billboard it was a billboard up by um McKinley in 41 and it just said let them run and, and I mean he just he built that bit horizontally over for weeks and weeks and weeks you know we'd talk about it it was a it was a whole play on the you know the running of the bulls at Pamplona and um, we, we finally found a location uh, at Fresno State the uh, the guys in the sheep unit I don't know what the official name is but you know the students at Fresno State in the Ag Department the race sheep they heard about it and they said, hey, we want to get in on this and because we're students, we can use the park that's on the other side, it's on the north side of Barstow there on the university. And you know, they, they actually sponsored the event and people got to come and run with the sheep. You know, you, uh, these, guys, these poor souls have no idea what's to happen. out of wool. <laughs> I wore to the event. It was awesome. <laughs> and, you know, people would be, you know, fake running because the sheep, the, they didn't really run, they just kind of walked fast. And so those people would look behind them and, you know, fake like they were scared. I mean, it was, it was a total dork event, but it was cool. We loved it. But you know, when you got something in your head and you're sitting in a room like this, you don't always know if people are laughing at you or with you. You know, you hope it's the one or the other, but I never could tell until that day how into it they were. And we get there, and, and there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who all get it. We were, we were simply doing what KRZR always did, and that's made fun of everything. I mean, there were no, there were no sacred cows at KRZR. Everything was fair game, including ourselves. I mean, since we didn't really care if the station made money or not, since we weren't seeing any of it anyway, why go through the typical thing where then you've got to register at somebody's store? Why not just get a bunch of people to contribute what they have, see how far it can take it, because they're going to have an idea, grab a, a grab bag full of prizes, or no prizes, just to say you did it, and do it that way, and nothing built on the air. Um, quite, running of the sheep built pretty hard in the air, but nothing built like the straight pride parade. There was it wasn't a hate thing, it wasn't a, it was a, hey, everybody else gets their day, so what about straight people? Let's have a parade, and plaid's the color, and w that was our color, because what's straighter than plaid? You know, a lot of people took that as, we, it was some sort of an anti-gay statement. It was not. We went to make, we went to great lengths to make certain that there were no slurs, uh, that was not a hate campaign. It was a parody. It was satire. You know, it was a bunch, a bunch of straight people saying, you know, we're straight, we procreate. I mean, whatever. The city was not happy about that. There was that moment of, hey, it's okay to give a permit to anybody else, but you're not a special interest group. You're just a bunch of straight people. We don't want troubles. And um, we brought the petitions out to the fair. We were out at the fair constantly and the fair was going on at the time and, and so we brought our petition out and once we had a butt pile of signatures we were allowed to bring it to the city and go for a permit and we got the permit but i felt like if they said no they knew we were gonna we were gonna publicize that and make a stink out of it and so i think that they said they finally just caved in and said yes we need to allow this parade to happen the parade route was um in downtown fresno it was around um 
It's around the water tower. I don't even know the streets. I drive past the thing every day. It was Fresno Street and uh, O Street and um, it was just, you know, downtown streets on a Saturday afternoon. Nobody was downtown, so we, we got to parade ourselves around. A lot of media coverage for that? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because you know what? And this is one of those things that made Cares Year great again. It was the thing that everybody wanted to do and nobody else had the balls to do. You know? I, that's what it came down to. Cares Year was that a lot. It was like, we want to... Uh, it might be people that stop listening or stop watching if we do something like that. And ZR didn't care. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. And it's not about you or you or you or you. It's just something we're going to do. So either get on board or get out of the way. In that, in that uh, what was it, 63 Cottonell suicide doors, same car Kennedy got killed in, we're in a tux with a, with, with a plaid cummerbund and a ball cap. That, that was as good as it got. And we did it on a Saturday. You know, so down, the city was clever. They gave us a permit for a Saturday, so there's nobody down there. But 3,000 of us got out there. Yeah, I got, that's my proudest day in radio. That was fun. That was, holy cow, we really can't put this together. Cowboy did. Oh, yeah, okay, major wager. We used to do the bladder bet, first of all. Can't do that since Sacramento and the we for a we incident. But we had them drinking beer. You had to drink a pitcher of beer each quarter, and then and you weren't allowed to go pee. And if you, and beer's different. It has salt in it. Doesn't doesn't do what water does. It's okay. Um, but you had to drink the four pitchers of beer, and you weren't allowed to pee. And if you if you could hold it, you won a million dollars in major wager money, which you could track cash in for a t-shirt or what. Major wager was huge. Million dollars for a shirt. <laughs> For a shirt, um, but so we used to do the, the. I watched a guy wet himself in the front of a bar because he was not <laughs> going to go to the restroom. Um, but we That's did right. the, the million dollar bladder bet, and then at halftime we would do crotch bowl, where you lay a guy on the floor, and every week somebody would volunteer. It was amazing, and they lay down on the floor, and we put either glasses. And this is like Roland, our friend major. has crazy Roland thick glasses. glasses. We yeah. use his yeah, glasses, the glasses because yeah. they were this thick, you know, yeah. co-file glasses. And we put the glasses on her and spin her around and, and throw her at the guy who was holding a football on his junk. And and she'd walk up and, whoa, drunken and bl glasses, bleary-eyed, and kick. And we would bet on whether she'd get turf or not. Thor, Thor. Oh, Thor. yeah. Oh, yeah. God. There was one week we had the, the he, he volunteered for crotch bowl and we spun her around and she walked up and planted her foot. I swear she was in soccer or something. Oh, she was like Olympic, man. And he curled in a ball so tight. I've never, he was like a ball bearing and rolled under a table. And that sound, it was, it was a combination of thwack and thud and man whimpering. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> never heard anything like that before in my life. To this day, I've never heard anything like that. And I remember going to E going, RJ and I aren't getting along. And he's like, yeah, so what? And I go, Bauer wants us to get a couple fish and wants us to beat each other with it. And I remember E going, well, you're not going to do it inside. But if you do it outside, what kind of fish? Like Kenny Baker was one of our favorite sales guys. Yeah. And Ken goes, uh, if you can get the fish, I can get the ball of ring. And he looked at us, looked at Kenny, kind of looks at the sky, like he usually did, just kind of looked around, you know, and he goes, if you're going to do it, make sure it's good. The six months of, of pent up frustration with RJ had just. Uh, just kind of got me to the smooth basket. Yeah. Like, Are you taking this crap no more? It, it's good. I get, I get one shot in with this fish. I swing, I hit him, he blocks it. And then he decides that he's not going to hit me with the fish. He's going to push me. He's going to try to pick me up and body slam me. He looks to Bauer. I was trying to see if it was okay. Like, I'm like, is this cool? If I can, can I do this? He's dropped the fish. He just wants to fight me in the ring now. <laughs> like, he's forgot the whole concept. Bauer says no. Or so, nods at you or something. Somehow, but I, I get him down. I remember I grabbed the fish again, and I just start smashing it in his face. And he starts I'm like, he's like yeah. cheese grater style, like all over my face, running all over it, off my nose and my mouth, my ear. The whole Bell thing. rings. <laughs> I get up and there's a fish eye pops out of his nostril. Right. Yeah, a fish eye comes out. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. Well, I forget was I don't have any underwear on. <laughs> and he's trying to take pictures. And to say that I almost teabagged my boss. <laughs> Pretty close. Wing bowl. <laughs> Talk about it. Wing bowl, man. Wing bowl. Wing bowl was awesome because, and, and here's the thing. 
because we hated each other when you started working there. But the great thing was, when you came along, now we had a rivalry. Because there was an afternoon show and a morning show that just wanted to kill each other. And that was awesome. And when we did the first wing bowl, and, and you got to see firsthand that, you know, being the, being the bad guy isn't necessarily just a cartoonish comic book. <laughs> this is what it is. Like, seriously, there was some hate involved. <laughs> I couldn't believe people took it so seriously. <laughs> I was like, these people want to fucking kill me. Yeah, there were people that seriously wanted to beat the shit out of you in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. But it what, what was awesome, and it was awesome for the station, and it was better than cross promotion because it was cross angst. It was just talking shit on each other back and forth, and and. Listeners were so very, very involved because you had your cadre of Rick Rodham faithfuls that were going to be out there and they were going to be doing your thing. And, and we had our front row people that were out there. And I thought there was going to be a rumble in the parking lot. Like there was a lot of intensity. There was a lot of intensity. And it wasn't just all aimed at you. There were factions that were like, wow, we got the socias and the greasers here. There's a good possibility that somebody's going to whip out bicycle chains in the parking lot. We're going to have a problem. <laughs> I have to admit, I, I have an innate distrust of government. I mean, we need it to some degree, but it's too big right now. It's gone too far. Uh, it's been going too far for quite some time. Uh, we did an event in 2000, um, the Endangered Species Banquet, where all the meat is rare. And it was, um, I mean, was kind of take off of, of a movie. I don't remember the name of the movie. Um, the Freshman, that was the movie. The Freshman. Where, I mean, we pretended that we were eating endangered species. I mean, the promo copy said things like, you know, have you ever had snail darter? You know, what does spotted owl really taste like? The, the, we didn't have anything endangered. We were just pretending that we did. But I, I knew that we had won when two days before the event, I get a call from an official of the Department of Fish and Game in Sacramento who gets me on the phone and says, now, Mr. Johnson, please tell me that you're not really serving endangered species at this banquet. And I said, well, you know what, officer? Truth be told, it would blow our street cred um, if everybody knew that everything that we were serving um, had been purchased off a website from Seattle. Now, it was some pretty bizarre crap. I mean, we, you know, we were eating cobra and, and turtle and rattlesnake and emu and kangaroo and, you know, some pretty crazy things. But none of it was endangered. It was just part of the shtick. But I, I, I loved getting calls from state agencies who got their underwear in a knot. People at a local radio station claim all they were doing was pulling a harmless prank in their eyes until the CHP overreacted, they say. Brendan Conway has the story. You hear him? He just kicked us out of his office. What? He just locked the door. What? He locked the door to his he office? Just, he just came and pushed us out of the door and locked it. He didn't want our gift? That gift was more accurately a female blow-up doll. So Rick Rodham sent cerebral Paul over with this inflatable doll, and, and the office staff freaked out. I mean, they, they blew it all out of proportion, um, you know, unbeknownst to Rick and, and his afternoon show at the time, you know, assemblymen are protected by the highway patrol. So before you know it, there's the highway patrol there. And, uh, you know, they, they confiscated some of the evidence, they threatened the station. I, I, I really took great offense to that, not as a bit. Um, I mean, the bit was just what we always did. We were making fun of somebody. But I, I, I really thought that constitutional rights were stepped on. I really thought the state of California went way too far over something that was pretty minor. Uh, I really believe to this day that that was a case of law enforcement that stepped over the line. And because they were law enforcement, they were able to cover their own tracks. I've forgotten more concerts than most people have been to. And it's just, we did a lot of concerts. We did a lot of concerts. I remember him saying, oh, I saw Megadeth. In fact, that was one of the first places I met you. I said, I saw Megadeth here. <laughs> that a club that was around for four years is still so infamous. People still talk about it 20 years later. You know that. To our salad days, we did everybody at that club from Chris Isaac to White Zombie, 
uh, Guns N' Roses. I booked them when he was still uh, the Old Town Saloon to uh, country acts like Susie Boggess, Eric Burden and the Animals. Green Day played the club. Um, Stone Temple Pilots, I, my, my name was Big Rock back then. Stone Temple Pilots played Big Rock's $2 chili uh, night at the, uh, the Cadillac Club. And how, how many people would the, fit in the Cadillac Club? Legally? <laughs> Legally, I think we were rated for about 400 people, 390, something like that. But I think the statute of limitations is run, so I remember uh, White Zombie showed about 750 people. It was it, it was it was it was a perfect extension of what KRZ was at the time. It was loud. It was a little dirty. Uh, you felt perfectly at home. I believe it used to be an old uh, newspaper where they bring the big reams of uh, newspaper, and it was where they would store it. And it's just a big concrete building. Um, had a big stage. Had big sound lights. It was a showcase venue. We didn't do cover bands there. It was strictly touring acts, touring comedians, you know, everything. What was the worst show you ever saw then? Oh my God, what's the dude from Wasp? Blackie, Blackie Lawless. Blackie Lawless decided long, long after the minuscule career of Wasp was over, that whatever little heyday they might have had, he decided the Cadillac Club would be where he would launch the two worst consecutive words in the world rock opera uh, and, and I think that's the legacy of the Cadillac Club it wasn't we catered to the artists um, but then again we catered to the fans too because like I said you name, name a band and I, my brothers will look at each other someone will be talking about a band that's out or a band that's coming through and I'll look at my brother Peter who's a co-owner at the Cadillac Club we'll look at each other they played there too yes they did so. the women at the Nelson concert were ravenous in fact I was scared I had to leave. The the um, you know you you see early scenes of you know women screaming over the Beatles. That's the way they were over Nelson. A Nel two dyed blonde ch child actor twins should not be the concert most of us remember the most, considering the kind of concerts that came through KRZR. I mean, we had them all, and we played them all. But Nelson was Nelson. We did that one. Did you do the Nelson? Yeah, that was huge. Although, instead of getting security guards, I thought we'd have to hire maybe 50, 60 babysitters. That was the prime and perfect moment for little mini dresses. <laughs> there was nothing like it. I've never seen that many ravenous, and it's the only word, women. They were hitting on anything, but only because they wanted really badly to go meet Nelson. I don't think a single guy who worked for KRZR that night went home with anybody. But we all managed to get suckered into bringing those girls backstage to meet Nelson. <laughs> I've heard that the women were just scandalous at that show, like just the, the manner of dress, it was just that time. Rick, they were 12. <laughs> Manfest started out as the most ugly, inbred, bastard spawn of corporate radio that there could ever possibly be. The first Manfest was because poor John Townsend uh, was told that he, by the corporate suits, that he had to make a certain amount of money. John Townsend was a sales manager, loved John Townsend. But he was told he had to make a certain amount of money or his, or his gig was up by the first quarter. If he didn't make X amount in the first quarter, he was gone. So we came up with this idea, well, if we got some girls in bikinis and maybe a couple of bands and I can sell some booths, we can sell some t-shirts and uh, we can do it at this park in, in Sanger for, uh, or excuse me, no, in Selma, Pioneer Park in Selma, we can do it for nothing. And it, the first one was terrible. It was just terrible. I was embarrassed by it. The beer guzzling pig comes to mind at Manfest. We were backstage and we were getting ready to do the chug off with the wild boar and I don't remember what his name was. Lucky. Lucky, Lucky the wild boar. And um, and some for some reason somebody from Fox 26 showed up because they were going to cover the manifest, 
And I remember writing those press releases, so I was like, yes, finally, we're getting some coverage. And later that night, there was something about PETA and, like, owning an illegal wild animal and how we were abusing it by drinking beer. That was awesome. I recorded it. Over the years, we managed to improve it. We got bigger bands. We actually got a budget for it. Uh, we proved to the company that we could do good rock shows and put a little bit of coin in their pocket also. Run-ins with Bridget the Midget that day at Manfest. Well... I remember we were sitting backstage and I remember when she pulled up, she got out of the, the van because she had a driver and she was already stumbling pretty good, you know, so <laughs> I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't really check out her band all that much, I gotta be honest, too. But uh, <laughs> it never heard a crowd boo so loud as when they finished their first song and she's all, Fresno! And they're all, boo! <laughs> In fact, I think she stormed off like three quarters of the way through. And then she had a meltdown that Rick had to talk her down off the top of her tour van. <laughs> My best concert experience, I think, was when I got to introduce Slipknot. And, and Rick's great idea was to go up there and go, like, hey, if you scream loud enough, tell me you're gonna flash. But they don't. I remember going up and there were two cops on the side of the stage, people couldn't see them. And I got booed off the stage and it was the coolest feeling ever and people still talking about it. Remember that time you were fucking teased? Why are we talking to you? <laughs> I'm Mike Bass from Six Ounce Clubs. I'm the bass player, obviously. <laughs> it's not Mike Drums. <laughs> well, KRZR was, was, at the time, the only you know, local station that was even giving anybody a chance. You had an hour that you played local, local music. You, know, you guys were intricate in, the, at the time, like the Planet Gigs and things like that. You jumped on and you talked. And you know, as, a, as a local rock DJ, I mean, you're, you're very important to the local scene. So the DJs and the station were very, were very big, and the, the opportunities that you gave, the battle of the bands that we got to be a part of, you know, to open for Corn, to open for Papa Roach and Motor Grader, and I mean, the list goes on. You guys kept bringing them to town and giving us more and more opportunity. Talk about those local events where, you know, I think obviously the big one was, you know, that that battle of the bands where the one someone was going to open for corn you know just that show and then and then maybe the corn show too you're going to give me the chills just thinking about it again i think about it all the time it's probably one of the best feelings of my life i don't know which was better the night before or the night of the night before was the battle of the bands and we ended up pulling the last spot and as we're warming up in the back because there was stipulations about loading on fast or slow you know you had to be on and off by 10 minutes and uh, so we were getting everything ready back there and you could hear the crowd chanting our name and I was just like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen, you know. And, and sure enough, we won and I definitely didn't sleep that night. I sat right there for hours at a time just staring off into space. We're just waiting for the we get there, we unload and sell in arena. Nothing better than playing sound check to an empty arena because you can hear everything and it's just booming and every song you play you're just like man that's the best song we've ever played because <laughs> it sounds like a cd and then you know as we're as we're getting ready back there we're sharing a dressing room with skindred and breaking benjamin and uh we're drinking beers and stretching out and getting closer to game time we we get up to the side stage and the stage manager walks over and he's like okay you guys ready we're like yeah we're ready he goes Three, two, one, boom, lights go out, crowd goes crazy, flashlights start going like this, and those flashlights are for us. Selling arena with corn, dude, unreal. That's right about the time that we signed with our label in New York, and we released that album with Where Do I Go On It, and everybody really latched onto it, everybody really, really jumped on it. And <laughs> You know, that was a dark day um, because that was an idiot who colored outside the lines. You know, all the radio stations played really rough with each other, uh, but we knew where the lines were. Um, we didn't destroy each other's property. It's a collective soul where uh, I think my PD got arrested on that one. Uh, they were like, we'd get a parker truck and then see how we get some big tow truck to come in the middle of the night and like haul it away. So, new rock shows up, Day of Collective Soul, 
we've got these marine flatbed trucks in front of the Wilson. We've got the two and a half foot story, you know, hair that's rocking in the wind. We got these speakers that are massive. We own the street. All our cars are up and down it. Bannered ZR everywhere. And the gay pride truck is down the street, sitting in its little self. And the new rock people show up thinking they've got front row to the Wilson, and they have nothing. And, uh, and they're pissed. Next thing I know, they're like, Don O'Neill, Dick O'Neill's getting arrested. You know, <laughs> get, get, get the camera, get the camera, he's getting arrested. Well, Don got so mad at me and, and fired up that he went and tried to cut our broadcast. He went and tried to cut our power lines. Yeah which is a federal offense. Uh, he happened to cut Star's power lines, not mine, <laughs> not ZR. Uh, so anyways, I grabbed the camera, and they're rolling, they're putting him in the, uh, the uh, police car, and as they're putting, you know, the head into the car, I'm like, Don, Dick, dude, smile for the camera, and I'm just snapping pictures at him, and he's just, you, you fucking bitch, I'm sure, you know. But uh, that was a dark day because uh, it drew the attention of the police to the shenanigans that had been going on for years. And so they, they clamped down on the stations with noise ordinances. We, we couldn't play the loudspeakers anymore. We couldn't play the music out on the streets uh, at the concerts. Um, we couldn't do the stunts that we did. That, that PD blew it for Fresno Radio. There really are people in suits and ties who count how many songs an hour you play, and they think that it's make or break to your radio station. When you know that since it's a rock station, if you listen long enough, you're still gonna hear your favorite song. But in between, here's some other stuff that we're able to bring to you, because we care enough to try. I, I would say by the time we got to the millennium, to, to the year 2000, is is kind of when it probably took a turn for the for the worst. We really approached every day on the air as we may all get fired tomorrow. They may shut the transmitter off tomorrow. We're going to make the best of every single day. And that attitude carried into the corporate years. Um, we were used to calling our own shots to some degree. And we fought for ourselves. Um, from 1989 to 2000, KRZR had eight different owners. The nice things about small companies changing hands and looking to flip a profit and turn a station is that they're not really paying attention to what you're doing. And so for all the times that people say, boy, KRZR got away with so much stuff, that's right, because nobody was looking. KRZR didn't really become corporate until the money started running out. And here's what I mean by that. The internet crash of 1999 affected radio in a very, very bad way. Um, radio as a whole um, took a lot of advertising from a lot of these internet companies who, you know, they weren't, they, their stock wasn't worth the paper that it was written on. Uh, radio stations all across the country blew off local advertisers and blew off local relationships because they thought they were going to ride the internet uh, gravy train. Well, when, when the internet stock crashed, uh, a lot of those local advertisers never came back. And poor E. Curtis, because he knew he was, he, it was his baby, it's his child. That whole state, there's no KRZ over that E. Curtis. He was the first guy there. It became, even he had to start repeating what his overlords were saying, which was, that's a really great idea. Here's why we can't do it. it we always felt that our, our bosses' bosses could be assholes, but you knew that they still cared. They still cared about the listeners, they cared about the employees. And once the, the change in ownership came, that sense of caring just withered. It didn't, it, I didn't feel like they really cared. And it was like a flower on the sidewalk, man. Right? Just after he couldn't, he couldn't survive, couldn't stand. And then I started to see people that uh, I had seen a lot of light behind their eyes. That light started to fade. That made me sad. It's stupid, but one of the things that sticks out in my head was. Um when Dennis Leary came out with the asshole song, you weren't allowed to say asshole on the air. So we had to introduce the song. as the, We were allowed to play the song, oddly enough, but it was the a-hole song. And somewhere along the line, somebody just decided that we were going to start saying asshole. And so we started introducing it as such. Here's Dennis Leary. It's the asshole song. 
And then it was, then it was a game. <laughs> then it was how many times can we use asshole in a two minute break because, you know, <laughs> we can say it now. Now it's one of those words we're allowed to say. And then, I don't know, corporate took over, Janet Jackson showed nipple, Psh, asshole was gone. When you left, did you know that was the end of the front row? No. Um, when I left in 04, I'll tell you the exact reason why I left KRZR in 04. Because Incubus is the sorriest band I have ever heard in my life. And I'm kind of being facetious, but I'm kind of not. I was 44 years old when I left KRZR. And so, the, the whiny, my dad was mean to me, Incubus music, I, I was... I, I wasn't really relating anymore. And I knew I could talk, and I wanted to see if I could do it without music. Simple as that. At that point, we kind of had all shifted. You know, with Chris gone, I kind of shifted into the first chair, and Brad had shifted into the second chair, and it was a natural, awesome opening. And unfortunately, once they came down with it, you can't have Chaz, you can't, no, we need, a, we need basically first chair in there. We're looking to replace first chair, not third chair. At that point, I knew, oh, well, our days are numbered. They have no faith in the rest of the show, and now it's just a matter of looking for a reason to get rid of us. And that was like, a, that really was like losing a family member. It was, or, or losing your family. But the, the family was still there. That's, I, I can't say enough about the listeners at KRCR who, who were there to just say, you know, we, you know, we like what you did. We, we like you. And uh, regardless of what anyone else says, they, we were, they're there just to, to say something, or, or to, they'll, they'll be there for you. And it always meant a lot. You were, Chris and I had a show in San Francisco for a while, but my heart, a lot of my heart was right here. I couldn't, I didn't leave. I've so. met Rick Bentley a few times, a nice guy, you know, um, but he's, he's doing his thing. He's doing his thing. Um, and that really surprised me. I remember after the front row was let go, he said, he had written a column saying, I've never received so much reaction to the point where I'm going to dedicate a column to the letters that I received. Uh, and I still have that column. And it, it God, it, I can't even tell you. It made me cry. There, I can still pull that out, and those letters will make me cry. It's, um, that made everything corporate not matter, you know, because I never did it for them. I did it for the people that turned on the radio every morning. And to be able to see, you know, we don't always get that feedback. It, it's, um, I mean, sure, there's people that call, and, and sure, sometimes if you're out at a remote, you know, maybe a couple people will come by but it's hard to know it's really hard to know if it matters at the end of the day if we are doing really matters to anybody and to see those letters and that support and that now it's taken away and 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 that hurts me and that makes me sad and that touches my life was absolutely incredible i knew we kind of had taken the wrong step now looking back on it when when we decided to add man cow which was a syndicated morning show to the station you know, I think uh, we were hoping for big things, but, you know, that was kind of the first nail in the coffin. Every day was a beatdown. Every day was, was some corporate force or, or some guy telling me that, uh, you know, what we were doing wasn't working. And there were, there were a lot of decisions that, uh, that uh, I got pressured into. Uh, some bad decisions that I signed off on. Man cow, bad, 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 bad decision. Bad decision. No offense to man cow. Um, but we zigged when we should have zagged. You know, I, I shouldn't say I didn't listen. I, I flipped, flipped the dial a few times. And it, it, to listen for 10 seconds and go on is really a fair shot at anyone. But what I heard in that 10 seconds was crap. And all, everything I read, I, they'd almost, I was tuned to the, uh, the bar nappy for a while, you know, just eagerly saying thank you to everyone. Uh, I I saw a lot of hate pouring out, and maybe he didn't deserve it because he stepped in for, you know, when a love show leaves, whoever steps in is going to take the heat. It doesn't matter if they're the best show in the world. They're going to really take a lot of, a lot of anger. I didn't expect Man Cow to work. I mean, for a lot of reasons. First of all, you're, um... And we talked about this, and I don't know how much you've talked about this or not, but you were supposed to have the morning show. And that would have been the worst thing that ever happened to you, because any time you replace a beloved morning show with anything else, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. It's going to fail, because people are so pissed off that you took away their routine, their part of their day, that you can't just plug something else in. Now being a local morning show host, I would say that having a local talent in the morning is imperative, you know. Um, something changed about it. I know that 
I remember the day that they made the announcement, and I remember the day you walked out. And I remember her wanting to follow you, but being scared because I didn't know where we were going. The company wasn't spending any money at that time. There was no promotional efforts. We, we were a, a product that was changing, and the audience was changing, and the corporate entity didn't really care. Uh, I think to some degree they had kind of written the station off at that point. You know, could, could somebody have followed the front row? Sure. Uh, absolutely someone could have. Um, but it didn't work out that way. You know, the, the sun and the moon and the stars were not in alignment uh, at that time. And, and we, were, we were lucky to still be on the air. Uh, Rev, who had experience with the format and with the audience, and uh, so then we took over, and I was um, nervous because KRCR was a legend. I mean, with CR, dude, we just sit around, come up with like, well, what can we do today? That's like stupid, you know, like, well, what can we do today? So we got like a, our intern in a diaper, and, and then he's digging through the trash because my ex like accidentally threw some shoes away and it rained, and like there's, you know, garbage water up to here and he's in a diaper digger. You know, it's like, just whatever. Yeah, why not? Let's do that. That would be fun. Why not? After Man Cow, I mean, you could have put just about anybody on. I <laughs> think it would have worked. But we came out with guns blazing and uh, people were excited because we were, we were bringing back some of that attitude. We were local. I mean, that's a big deal too. You know, the, we're guys that, that we're in the community. You know, we live next to the listeners kids go to school with you, and uh, we were out on the street. It was, it, it, we did well, you know. He brought me in his office and, uh, you know, said, I gotta tell you something. You know? So I was like, what's going on, you know? And, and, and to be honest, I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe we're changing even the format of KRC here at that point in time. But uh, no, he, he, he surprised me when he said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving, you know, I'm, I'm, they're gonna, let me uh, finish out my, my two weeks here, but I'm, I'm out of here, you know. And uh, I basically told him, you know, you, you can't go, you know. And he said, I'm, I'm out of here, you know, I'm going. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what I think. It's like, it's time for me to go. You know, I, I had to look at the writing on the wall. At that same time was that whole vortex intersection of record company money drying up, you know, radio station balloon payments started being due. I mean, it, it was the intersection of, of death and hell. It was his baby. It's his child. That whole state, there's no KRZR without that occurs. He was the first guy there. I got to be the coach. I'm, I'm proud, and I was a player too. Um, I got to be the coach and player of a really powerful team for a really, really long time. Um, of a station that should have gone away a million times. Uh, you know, early owners going bankrupt. I mean, the, the company that owned us, the two months after KRZR went on the air, the company filed for bankruptcy. We didn't have money for a long, long time. We could have been bought by a number of people who would have changed the format in a heartbeat. I mean, we just, we got lucky for so, for so long. Um, you know, I was, I was, it was the, the little engine that could. And, and I was proud of the fact that we, we built something really good and something that the audience really liked from nothing. I was proud of that. We should fire E. Well, that's a great idea. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Let's do that. It's like they just picked the most random things. I remember calling like, what's this website thing? What, you know, tell them it's not true. You know, if it's not true, then, well, that's just gonna spread the rumors. You know, don't give any, any gas to the fire or whatever. I knew it was, it, I told Doug, so we've had this new boss for like, what, six months or something now, and he hasn't met with us? I mean, either we're doing such a great job, just, just kicking so much ass, that he doesn't need to even talk to us, or they're going to get rid of us here real quick. And then we are, you know, then we saw 1037 The Beat, uh, uh, The Beat Fresno um, website. There was a website, uh, and we're like, so we go, and uh, I think it was Doug goes and asks, uh, and they says, uh, no, no, we're not planning or anything like that. No, it's all good. He said, oh, no, there's nothing to worry about. So, which means uh, they're just bullshit, usually. But what is this? What, 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 what's going on? Oh, and his reply, and I don't know how much, I mean, I know that he knew, 
But I mean, obviously, as Andrew Tiny Kim tells, he goes, I don't know. He goes, it's, it's, it's a radio, he goes, it's some type of stunt. Interesting thing is that of the four rock stations that were operating at the time they pulled the plug on KRZR, KRZR was still on top. No idea. I mean, like I said, like I've said, like we had a whole calendar planned. Um, we had promotions lined up. Um, we were moving forward, and, and and in fact, when the rumors started circulating, I was like, "There's no way they're going to flip us because I just got a calendar paid for." Uh, the operations manager, Paul's successor, uh, comes by and uh, says, "I need you to come in for a meeting." And I happened to come in, and I saw our general manager walking around, and the HR person that we refer to as the Angel of Death was wandering around. I knew something was up. They called me in, and... Did they, you know that it was your last day there? No, God, no. People in the building knew. I wish they would have given you a little heads up. Well, I'd walk in, and there's the boss and HR, and then the, the big cheese. And I go, well, I guess I don't need to sit down. And, that's, and I'm like, and I'm like looking for my papers. I just knew. And I was going through so much personal stuff. My life would just... I mean, I'd be coming home from the show and just staring at the wall for six hours. When I found out, out that uh, I was being let go, I didn't know the chief station was changing format. I just was told I was being let go. Um, and at the time, I had a family uh, crisis going on. The, the very same day, my wife was told that she had breast cancer. So he's waiting on that. He's talking to her. They, they, they don't just say, like, oh, hey thanks and this and that and go clean out your desk. It's like you can't get anything out of your desk. They escort you out, take your key, you know, whatever. They walk you out the door like a criminal. And then I get pulled in to uh, the operations manager's office and HR is in there and I'm thinking I'm done. And they purposely go, you still have a job, you still have a job. And then the speech was, as of, uh, I, think, I believe it was 12 p.m. I go, as of 12 p.m., KRZR no longer exists. I remember it was 11 o'clock. And I got called into the, to the office, the corner office with the trifecta, the, the PD, GM, and the HR person. And I went, well, this isn't good. And I was like, look, is KRGR gone? I just cut him off. I was like, stop fucking with me. Don't sugarcoat it. Just tell me, did you just kill my baby? And, and yes, I uh, went to my office and I put on our Facebook page something like, it's been fun. And then I put on my, my Facebook page, um, you know, I'll always love you. And that was like kind of morbid, but it was just like, it was all I could say. Um, and then I went into the studio and I just started crying and Coyote came in and I remember flipping out the last song. I put a Rage Against the Machine song to play because it was going to flip at noon. It was right in the middle of my shift too, you know? Um, and I just remember crying and, um, we went up to a meeting or something and I came back down and just they didn't want us to stay there they didn't want to see the blood yeah, it's like this, the digital equipment equivalent of a skip it's like a skipping record and it would go off the air to come back on and then it went like they were having technical problems with their sign on and after just I mean browbeating uh browbeating uh, skip and I while we're, we're sitting there in court going look just give us a couple minutes to cry here literally cry leave us alone we're, no, we, 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 we're not gonna come they come in and had the audacity to ask us if we sabotaged the uh, onset of the new station. No, we didn't. After the station flipped, um, they didn't have their engineering done right, and shit wasn't playing, and they thought that me and Coyote sabotaged it. Like, they honestly asked me, like, they pulled Coyote and they pulled me in, like, did you change anything? We need you to get out. No, and I was like, you know what? No, that's the wild hair just kicking you one last time in the nuts for taking a kidney shot. Yes, it's fuck, it's voodoo. After being stripped mined by corporate radio, um, I left in February of 2007. They pulled the plug, what was it, September of 2010. And I'm really, really proud of the staff and what they did after I left. Uh, 20, you know, 21 years of kick-ass rock and roll, but it means more than that, I think, to the people of Fresno. It does when you see how people react to when it went away. Like the Facebook page is sprung up and all the stuff in the article. Still, people are doing that because something popped up on my thing the other day and people are still commenting on that. 
still commenting on Kara's here. Oh my God, dude, how many people? Like the first day was like three thousand five hundred or four thousand people. I don't know what it's up to, but it's it was like what, seven thousand people on Facebook on the Bring Kara's here back page. I mean, it was it was just like that. And if I if I get a little verklempt with the whole Rick Benley thing afterwards, where where the support was coming in to the point where the yeah. Fresno B had to acknowledge, and you gotta understand a little backstory there. There was a love hate relationship with KRZR and the Fresno B. So to see that that outpouring to the point where they had to acknowledge, we have to do something. We have to to say something about this because you know we're we're a venue for people to to talk. That really really got me. I mean more than I can ever put into words adequately uh, because that was my moment of son of a bitch they really they really liked what we did they don't care if we had 10 million people with, if we had 10,000 people with torches out there in the parking lot they wouldn't care it doesn't matter the outpouring was amazing I, I, you know, I was a little surprised by it what went through your mind that day that you heard about it? really? yeah what really went through my mind was that no matter what, and I, and I didn't want to, this wasn't a career change, but no matter what, Jan and Brad and I weren't going to get to do it one more time from there. And I hated those studios, but I mean, I just didn't physically like the way they were. Um, it made me feel, you know, I spent a third of my adult life working for KRCR. When that goes away, a little of you goes away, a little of you, you know, it, it, you get self-centered, like, you know, I'm, I'm getting old and, you know, uh, there are now going to be people who don't understand how special a station that was. I hear the cool kids talking to me telling me what they're why they're cooler than me what I should be doing or listening to or going to because they're telling me I should um, I really genuinely believe KRZ was hey we're going to party over here and it'd be awesome if you showed up and you're not too cool to be there and you're not too cool if you're not there yeah. we don't know that it's cool we're just going to do it and hope people show up and I really think KRZ always had that attitude and I, I think it made a difference because it wasn't out of anybody's reach it wasn't we're better than you or we're cooler than you or we're you know more hip than you or more whatever than you it's just let's all go have a beer and do something and see what happens Yeah. you know and I, I really think that was um, that was special there shouldn't be another KRZR there should not be. 1041 should not try and become KRZR. The Blaze should not try and be KRZR. The Fox should not try and be KRZR. And I think it's smart that they didn't try. They might have, you know, taken some of the music and done it. I think that uh, uh, the stations are realizing that with KRZR's departure, I think it's a responsibility of the other stations to put some attitude into what they're doing. Does it have to be dick and fart jokes? Does it have to be... Uh, show us your wild hair. Does it have to be the wing bowl? No. But it's all, if you're going to be Fresno's classic rock station, be ballsy. There aren't going to be rock stations like that anymore. I don't think there are very many anymore now. Unless they're in really small markets. And in that case, they probably don't necessarily have a full lineup of talent like ZR was so lucky to have. Um, something really good and really bad is gone and maybe for good story has so much weight and sometimes you'll meet someone and they'll they'll tell you remember that time when you told the story about how your van burned down the desert you almost froze to death yeah that well, i almost got pulled over the car let me go over here or something like that and, and it touched them and it touches me and it's 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 bigger than like you said it's bigger than all of us and when I, I have t-shirts now, all my characters are t-shirts, and some of them are getting pretty nasty. And my wife always wants, you know, this shirt today is coming. I'm like, no, no, you're not throwing that shirt away. I don't care if it's, if it's just a couple of strings. I'm saving that shirt because it, it has a sacredness to it. That everybody that was a part of it loved it just as much as everybody who listened. And that I'm sorry it didn't get what it deserved at the end, you know? I'm sorry. I remember it, though, like on a daily, I really do remember it on a daily basis. Like... It's random, you know, like I check my clock and it'll be 1037. 
I did it today at like 10 37 in the morning like I could check the clock any time of day why do I always look and it's 10 37 you know like and I know it sounds stupid but like I had my second daughter at 103 in the morning and she weighed seven pounds you know it really was a part of me like I really feel like it I loved it and I'm so sorry that it didn't that people didn't know that we didn't just leave them it was you know, just unique across the board. Unique with the promotions we did. Unique with the on-air personalities. Just, just special. It, it, it was a special station, and and I, and I just love that we could do whatever we could drink, you know, whatever whatever crazy idea would stick on the wall. That was what we were going to go with, and um, that was that was fun. It, it was a fun fun station to work for. You know, it really was a fun station to work for, and. Uh, you know, there, there was there was days or nights I'd come home and I'd feel pretty dirty because of whatever I had just been a part of. You know, I, whatever whatever that was. You know, I needed a, I needed a cold shower, but uh, but it was fun. Yeah, I remember reading about Kino and all the boss jock guys that came out of here. And Karen's here, you know, honestly, and you talk to you know you know a lot of record guys and they become your friends, the good ones. You know. Um, and it's like, you know, this is like the last station like this. And I was talking to one of the guys who used to work with us. I go, do you realize you're so lucky to work here? This is one of the last honest rock stations. This is it, man. You, they don't, you don't do it like this anymore. It's totally, you know. And a legacy is, uh, I mean, what a kick at, kick and ass for tw almost 22 years. It just it's a solid ass whooping. Came in, kicked ass, and never stopped. We had to be the dirtiest station in America. And of which we are supremely proud. That's why we're doing the film. <laughs> yeah. It and wouldn't be a funny film otherwise. 18 years with no dump button. No delay. How many times do you think that? We took calls live, dude, with no screener. Rock people. Zipper heads all messed up in the morning. Just, how you doing? What do you want to say to 35,000 people? I think there was a special connection. Um, we were real. We we invited them to our house, uh, and they invited us to their houses. I, I mean, we went. I mean, the front you know, used to, front row used to do broadcasts from people's bedrooms, you know, in the morning. Um, I mean, we had. I mean, one time Chris Daniel had a, you know, a light the flame contest. Uh, in the studios of KRZR where, you know, guys were eating beans and broccoli and with lighters trying to make blue flame. Uh, you know, it, we, it, it, was, it was real in the sense that we did the same dumb things that they did. I think about, you know, being, not me, but a listener, you know, a dude, you know, he's just a dude and he's too skinny and he's not good looking and he doesn't know where he's going. He's 17, you know, and, it, there was one place you could go where the people were either singing or talking about stuff that, that mattered to you at that point. This film is dedicated to all the talented people who worked at KRZR, all the awesome people who listened, and all the legendary rock stations that aren't around anymore. This is the story of rock radio in Fresno, but it could easily be the story of the kick-ass rock station in your hometown. Long live rock and roll, and long live the wild hair.
Hi, James. Not exactly what you expected to see, is it? I think you better come and see me. Goodbye.
right here. All right. <laughs> How do you like that? Yeah. The truth of the matter is, there are, there are so many culprits that could have stolen this. So many. What a nice surprise. You know what? I never ever got to say, and I always wanted to say, I always say, I say 103.7 KRZR, the wild hair. If I could have just, see, it's great to say it here, but if I would have had a mic and just one time, that's all I ever would have wanted. And every kid who ever listened to ZR did it at home, so shut up. <laughs> just say, beautiful movie. Uh, Sk yeah, tell me, tell me what you did. Skippy, Skippy did great in it, you know, she, she kind of worded it the way a lot of fans worded it, you know. Uh, Jen Lip, always insightful, Christina. It's just good seeing all of them on the screen, and when everybody got up here, I literally leaned over to my friend Lacey and I said, this is the way it would have been if they could have had a big party when it all went down. You know, it probably would have been a lot more wild, a little more nudity. I mean, Coyote still hasn't shown his ass, but this is the way it should have been. So keep that thing on. You might see his ass before the night's through, all right? All right, so I was, I was 19 years old, drunk. Call in. Coyote calls me in for a um, for a contest with now my wife. She was my girlfriend at the time. I didn't know what the contest was. was. We go down there. I find out it's a relay race. We have to sh shove a hard-boiled egg up our ass. Okay. For Ozfest tickets. For Ozfest tickets. Yeah. Okay. So so I I tell yeah I I tell I, I tell her you go first. I'll make up the difference on the way around. You know. Two of us and it was two guys. Yeah, we're going against two guys. So I said put the girl first. I put the, she puts the egg in her ass, goes around, hands it off to me, and I'm, you know, I'm so excited for this, I got my pants down ready for it, I don't even zip up my pants, I'm running around, on the last turnaround, I fall down, because the, my pants fell to my ankles, fall down, break one hand, sprain the other, didn't know it at the time, and my butt clinched the, uh, the hard boiled egg into a thousand pieces in my ass, so when I get to the end, the guy is like nicely peeling his hard boiled egg, but I knew, that I didn't have time to, to, to peel off the, you know, the hundreds of pieces of egg, so I, I threw the whole thing in my mouth, <laughs> the, the shell and all, ate, ate it down, but I lost. Fantastic so time. We didn't, we didn't get OzFest tickets. We didn't get the OzFest tickets, but... Uh, we got them over <laughs> Well, because I didn't the eat it. The, the other guy ate it first. The other guy ate it first. <laughs> but then he ended up breaking his, his hand. Yeah. He was falling down, and he, got, he actually got... Yeah, I got moved office. from I got moved from where I was working from the shop to the office because I couldn't work and it ended up landing me my fantastic job I have right now just because I ended up staying there. So I owe my current job to KRZR. <laughs> I like the movie, uh, a lot of the faces, you didn't see the faces, you saw the DJs, now I can put faces to it, and uh, now rock and roll is gone to computer rock and roll, people don't talk on the radio, don't have personalities, it's better to listen to your uh, MP3 player, you know, rather than the station they have now. ago cares here is gone but reliving the whole thing again cares here went off since the last time I listened to the radio so since then nothing nothing lives up to what cares here did so it's a damn shame yeah I do all the old school scenes that came up all the old stuff it brought back a lot of memories Absolutely. It was the best rock station we ever had, man. Sad to see it go. The Crips live on! And they sound better on iTunes, according to Terry Gray. <laughs> I have to. He's got an annoying camera. Wonderful guy, annoying camera. <laughs> Loved it. Awesome. Definitely brought back memories. <laughs> uh, memories of going to school and could not leave the car until we heard the freak show. 
was fantastic. It was fantastic. It was good. Oh, yeah. You know, it was great. You know, I interned there for a long time. For, oh, yeah, with uh, Mike Bauer and RJ. Yeah, was something I'll never forget those times. Great movie. Great. Wild hair, man, every time. <laughs> I cried. I laughed. I burped. I farted. I felt every human emotion. I'm just glad it was in 3D and not in my pants. Driving around town at that age, you would always see the various promotions. I remember one night we were going out for a party and we were going to somebody's house and it was that time somebody got in trouble for offering free beer. And we passed by the free beer banner on the house. There were cars everywhere and I heard them get in trouble with cops for doing free. I think that was part of that show as well. They're the ones that got busted. Well, the exciting to have a thorough explanation as to how and why uh, the channel disappeared and the station just went away. It was a complete surprise to me the day it happened. I just turned on my radio and crappy music was playing and I didn't know why. And I, it was, So to actually find out why and how and have it all tied up, was, it was really nice to see. I didn't like it, man. I didn't like it a bit. I loved it. Ah! No, no, no. It was, it was good stuff. Like, I yelled in there that I was never beat. Actually, I was beat. They brought in, like, this one cat. Chris Daniel threw me out to the, to the world. And this guy from Fresno State that was a Fresno State wrestler came in. That SOB snatched me up like a piece of bacon and dropped me on a sprinkler, a six-inch metal sprinkler. So that dude beat me. And the only two guys I ever tied were actually brothers. Otherwise, people would call, they would win a prize, and they had to give their name, their address, the social security number for that matter. And we would run around with that party transmitter and that KRZR drop bottom truck and wrestle people from like, oh, I don't know, like six, six to seven in the morning. I was never beat by a listener, but that doesn't mean that they didn't always win. Man, Cal, forget it. But Doug and the Rep had a good show. They really did. It's kind of like 
Did you see your ex-wife? Did you see the picture with her with her, with her other new husband? No. I don't want to look at the picture of my ex-wife with her new husband. She looks too happy. Holy shit, this is my parent. That, now, that wasn't ready for that either. That's really my parents over there. I, yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah, damn onion truck, what's up with that? Passed right by, made my house all water, it was weird, man. How did I become a fan? Oh hell, KKDJ sucks, so I went to KRZO. <laughs>